Hey y'all, how y'all doing? This is my review for Love and Marriage Huntsville, Season 5, Episode 1. Now, I thought that we were going to still be within Season 4, and this was going to be Episode 16, but the network is saying that it's Season 5, so I'm going to go with that, all right? And they didn't give us a whole lot this episode, but I'm going to review it a little bit that they did give us. So, it picked up where it left off, which was with Martel bringing the kids down to Mel's event, Uninvited. And he brought those kids, in my opinion, to gain access to Mel because that happened at a time where, you know, she was only conversing with him through email. Mel was his source of supply, okay? And he did that shit to gain access to her, in my opinion, and he used the kids to do it. He knew exactly what he was doing. And in my opinion, you know, he was hoping that that would open the door to Mel, allowing him in her space more often so that he could shoot his shot because we know that he loves shooting his shots. OK, then once he's rejected, he become an even bigger asshole than he was before. You would think that he loved rejection the way that he keep trying to get back with Mel, you know, and it's not like he, you know, done went off and did any kind of work on himself and came back as a new man. You know, he has continued to come back as the same nigga that he was when she left his ass, like either you slow or you slow. So Mel noticed that, you know, he was acting okay when he was there. And that's probably why she went on and invited him and his mama on that vacation because she thought that he was in the business of acting like he had some sense now. But it was all an act, okay? He wanted to gain access to Mel. And when he didn't get his way after gaining access to Mel, you know, meaning get her to um, take him back, he tried to hurt her again by filing for custody. You know, it's a never-ending cycle. He'll continue to do this shit for as long as he's allowed to, okay? And that's why I say you cannot work things out with a narc. And from experience, you know, they ain't trying to change. They want you to deal with them as they are. Change would mean them acknowledging that, you know, they're a fucked up person and then doing something about it. But that's not an option because they don't like being held accountable for shit. It's always everybody else's fault why they do the stupid shit that they do, okay? But moving on. So, yeah, y'all, he used some kids to get access to mail in my opinion so once he left Mel went and started getting ready for the second half of the show or whatever and you know she told the kids bye and her mama went you know to check on her back in the uh, dressing room and um you know she was just telling Mel how surprised she was to see Martel you know they both were then Mel went on to speak about how your actions don't just affect you but other people and was saying how their divorce had affected her mom too because you know, Van loved Martel like a son. And all I can say is that, you know, she'll get over it because that nigga ain't right. Let Marlene love him like a son. And maybe one day she can love his ass right on down to somebody's therapy session, okay? Instead of enabling him to be the trifling ass nigga that he is. So moving on, y'all. The couples, as in the Scots and the Whitlows, they started arriving to the couple's retreat that um, Tisha had invited them to for counseling with Dr. Francis and his wife. Kimmy and Maurice, you know, they were the first to make it. OK, Maurice was joking about how he was already fixed. And I was like, you may be fixed as in can't have no more kids, but your ass ain't fixed in the way that you most need to be. OK, I don't even know if he can be fixed because in my opinion, you know, Kim, Kimmy enables him by putting up with his bullshit. Kimmy should have walked into that retreat with a big ass sign on her shirt that read, hi, my name is Kimmy. And I had to go out and get me an emotional support dog because he gives me what I can't get from my meatball head ass husband. OK, he had the nerve to tell Dr. Francis that, you know, he didn't need a lot of work. So he would be happy to help the others in his circle, help with their marriage, help their marriage to be better. And that in itself was a complete joke. It's all about the jokes until it's about a divorce. But anyway, Tiffany and Lewis, they arrived next and they honestly could have stayed their asses where they were because they were so resistant to what Dr. Francis was trying to offer them, which was more effective ways to, you know, deal with things in their marriage. They tried to make it seem like, you know, things were OK, but clearly they weren't OK. And while they were there, Kimmy had called Tisha to see where she and Marceau was because they were late. They were waiting on them, and Tisha told him that, you know, they were en route and that they, uh, there was some kind of mix-up with the babysitter, I believe, and Marceau was talking about it was a lot of traffic. However, everybody else was able to make it there on time, but, you know, she uh, Tisha told him that her and Marceau would be there soon. So while they were waiting on Tisha and Marceau, Dr. Francis was just explaining to them, you know, the purpose of the retreat. He told them that, you know, he wasn't there to fix them. That's what mechanics do. They fix shit. He explained to them that he was there to expose them to a way um, for them to work through who they were and how it would impact their relationship. So in the middle of that, Tiffany, you know, let him know that she had to take a work call. 
you know, and it was like, yeah, she told Lewis about it beforehand, but Dr. Francis was, you know, he was expecting her to put work on hold while they were there as he expected from all of them. So they could fully commit themselves to the retreat, to the process. So, uh, this work call was supposed to take 30 minutes. All right. And y'all, Kimmy had her foot on the Whitlow's neck that entire episode. She was in the confession. It was like, we all had shit to do. And we put it on the back burner for the retreat. So, you know, Tiffany need to do better. You know, and she got in Lewis's ass as well a little later. Okay. Now, when it came to how Dr. Francis felt about Tiffany not leaving work on the back burner, Dr. Francis had an issue with that. He's not a big fan of people putting work before, you know, their spouse. Maurice said that he learned that from Dr. Francis during his session, you know, uh, with him. And I was like, that was only one of the things that his ass needed to learn. So after Tiffany left out, Dr. Francis was trying to explain to Lewis that he, as her husband, he should have had a problem with Tiffany leaving out as well because her working while they were at the retreat showed that, you know, she wasn't as committed as she should have been. OK, and he pointed out the fact that Tiffany didn't ask if it was OK. She just said that, you know, that's what she had to do. And she did it. He said that him and his wife cleared their calendar so that uh, Dr. Francis was saying that him and his wife had cleared their calendar so that they could be there. OK, they were committed and he was expecting everyone to do, you know, to do the same thing. So it was about commitment. And he told Lewis that Tiffany had competing interests and that if she's committed to being there she couldn't be committed to uh no what did he say he was pretty much saying that she couldn't be committed to the retreat and work at the same time okay he said um she can't be in work mindset and then marriage mindset because one must take precedent over the other so dr francis said that tiffany was letting him know that the retreat really wasn't that important to her and it probably wasn't Tiffany's main reason for being there, in my opinion, was for Dr. Francis to convince Lewis that they should have a baby and he wasn't going to do no such thing. OK, how she got time for a baby and not her husband. Tiffany is about as fickle as they come. But we later found out that her wanting a baby had a lot to do with the losses that she experienced throughout her life. OK, now, when Dr. Francis was explaining to Lewis how he felt about Tiffany leaving out for a work call, Lewis wasn't very receptive of that. He told Dr. Francis that he knew where him and Tiffany were and that he would let him address uh, whatever issue he had with Tiffany with Tiffany because he could only speak for himself because he was present. But he said that he would communicate that message to Tiffany. And he did when he went upstairs to check on her to see if she was done with her call. She had just wrapped up when he got up there and he told her that, you know, she was probably going to come back downstairs to an interesting conversation about commitment and being present. So. She going to say, so are the Scots here yet? As in Tisha and Marceau. And Lewis told her no. And she was like, oh, okay. In my opinion, that was her saying, well, they can't get on me about what I'm doing when everybody wasn't even there yet. And Dr. Francis set us straight, you know, with that when she came back downstairs. But, you know, before they continued with their session, Tisha and Marceau had pulled up in the driveway. So that, you know, they finally made it. And Dr. Francis and his wife met them outside. And he could tell from the look on Tisha's face that she wasn't too happy. But we learned that right as they were driving to the retreat, they learned that they had lost a good friend. She was one of Tisha's best friends and they had went to college and stuff together. And I remember a few months ago on Instagram, um, Tisha, among others, uh, in her circle, you know, they were celebrating the life of someone they knew that had passed away. So I guess this was that person that they were celebrating. Now, um, my soul didn't learn that um, they were going to the retreat for counseling until they were damn near there. But he said that being there was a healthy distraction for them. So that's probably why he didn't get as mad as he would have gotten had he not learned about their friend. Because y'all y'all already know how, you know, Marceau feel about counseling, about counseling. He's been totally against it, you know, and it's always the ones that need it the most who are the most resistant, okay, such as him, uh, his brother, and Martell, stupid ass. Martell need to have a shit. He need his whole fucking body super glued to a chair, okay, in somebody's therapy session. Make sure the chair reclines, get him a pillow and some blankets so his ass can sleep in there too. He don't need just the hour session. He need the 24-hour one. He need therapy all day fucking long, even when he sleep. 
Shit, they all do. Even the women that deal with their asses. So next, y'all, we have the scene with Martell and his enabler, okay, his number one fan, which is his mom, Miss Marlene. Now, that's her son. She's supposed to be his number one fan, but at the same time, you can't be supporting his bullshit. I feel like everything Marlene says, Martell, Martell just eats it up because she makes him feel like he's in the right when he don't know shit about being right. You know what I'm saying? The motherfucker is trifling. He's fucking terrible. And his childhood may have played a part in how he is today, which is why she may not be as hard on him as she should be, in my opinion. But it's not doing him any good by telling him, you know, that pretty much everybody else is the one that's doing him wrong. Because that's how he walking around, thinking that everybody else is doing him wrong. You know what I'm saying? And that's not that's not true. As long as he feel like he ain't doing shit wrong, he going to continue to do it. So she tagged along um, with him to go and pick up the kids from school. It was their last day of school. And, you know, they were talking and Martel, in Martel fashion, proceeded to tell his mother how pretty much, you know, he was a better parent and better person than Mel was, okay? That's what it boiled down to. He started telling his mama that even though it was his week, he took the kids to support their mom at her event. And like I said, him taking those kids had nothing to do with him supporting their mom, Okay. If he wasn't the bitch-ass nigga that he was, in my opinion, Mel probably would have accommodated him by bringing the kids to that book signing. But ain't nobody going to go out of their way for a bastard who makes it his business to try to make their life miserable. It's not going to happen. You know what I'm saying? He wants to make her miserable all because she set him free to fly around with the birds that he desired to be with. Okay? He don't want those kids supporting their mom in real life. He wants to turn those kids against their mother, in my opinion. That stunt was for him. Everything he does is for him. He wanted to prove that he was a better person than Mel, and he also wanted to gain access to Mel. He go around trying to convince everybody that she's this dark-hearted monster, yet he craves to be in her space. So he was sitting up there in the car with his pink shirt on, and that color, you know... He should wear that from now on. It's very fucking fitting, okay? So he feeding his mama the bullshit, and she drinking it up just like she does that wine, and he telling her how, you know, he just wanted to support Mel. And I was like, no, bitch, you don't want to support her. You want support from her, which is why you suing her for custody with your whack ass. So he tells her that, you know, it went well and that Mel was starting to let her guard down, which was exactly what he wanted Mel to do. And as soon as she let her guard down, he slid his ass in on to make a move you know what I'm saying and when she shut it the fuck down he came out swinging like a little bitch he did the windmill on male ass oh you ain't gonna take me back well I'm gonna take the kids bum ass you can't pay your attorney monopoly money in my opinion so how you gonna see the case through I don't think attorneys are in the business of taking IOUs it's hard for me to even see Martell as a man I envision him with fucking jelly sandals on and a damn lace front with baby hairs but anyway, y'all, he told his mama that Mel was letting her guard down, okay? And his mama going to say, it don't make no sense to keep him up. You can't have no bitterness in you. And I was like, well, you know what, Miss Marlene? That's easy for you to say because you wasn't the one who was being cheated on for several years of your marriage by your husband and was forced to end your 14-year marriage, okay? And businesses that you worked hard to build uproot your children from the home that they knew because your bitch ass ex-husband refused to leave your husband ain't refused to give you your furs and then turn around and wear them bitches to his wine lunch and out there making babies outside of the marriage he didn't steal seventeen thousand dollars out of your account your husband didn't buy his side chick a bmw with money that you was out there working hard for your husband didn't go out on the press tour telling the world that you wasn't shit your husband ain't got you up in court trying to take your babies away from you all because you don't want his ass no more. And he too fucking lazy and too slow to go out there and make shit happen for himself. So he want to eat off you and feed his hoes off you. So, of course, you wouldn't see a reason for her to keep her guards up. Because your son is the perfect man. Let you tell it. He can do no wrong, of course. So, y'all, I was just... So she going to say, you got to still have love in you. You know, the shit that Martell clearly never had for his wife, but she's supposed to have all the love for him. Mel is supposed to have all the love for Martell and continue to put up with his shit. Let my, you know, let Marlene tell it. You know, she then implied that Mel was trying to chop him down every chance she got. First off, Mel ain't got to chop Martell down because life going to chop him down. Why? 
because you can't be a dirty bitch and prosper. It just don't work like that. That's evident because everything he tries to do fails. Maybe his mama chooses to turn a blind eye to the shit, you know, her son got going on out there. Hear no evil, see no evil. But that don't mean that, you know, he ain't out there fucking over people. And that's her son. So, of course, you know, I'm sure she don't want to think of him as being the trifling ass nigga that other people may see him as. But, you know, if that's what he is, that's what he is. And I don't care how old your kid is. I feel like when they're doing wrong, you tell them that they're doing wrong. Whether they listen to you or not, you've done your part. Martell grown and she can't make him do shit. This I know. But I just feel like if you ain't going to help him, don't hurt him by making him think that, you know, the shit he's doing is okay. But like I said, maybe she don't know of everything that he's doing or have done. Maybe she's not online like that. I don't know. You know, but that scene was just ugh. So then, you know, she started talking about how she didn't appreciate Mel getting online saying things about her, you know, which she found to be disrespectful. She said that Mel was saying that she said something about her mother, um, Van, and she was talking about the shit that, you know, Martell took his milk dud head ass back to her and said. And even though Marlene said that she loved Mel and that she was still going to be her daughter-in-law or whatever, that's still Martell's mama and she's going to be on his side no matter what. Martell went and told his mama about something Van said or did. And one, you know, and um, one thing about Martell, when he tells his stories, they are never accurate. You know what I'm saying? They never happen the way that he tries to say that they happen. So his mama felt the way. All right. So then Martell tells her that he hopes that all of their relationships can get better. So let me translate, they, uh, translate that for y'all. What I feel like he was doing in that moment was saying, look, ma, I know I done told you all kinds of shit about Mel, okay? All lies, but I done got her to let her guard down. So now I'm about to try to get her back. I'm going to try I'm going to try to get her to take me back. And if she take me back, despite all the bullshit I told you about her, I need you to forget it. Okay? I need you to forget that I said it so we can go back to being a happy family. Because it's in my best interest that I try to get back with Mel. Because I'm hungry. Because I'm hungry. If it wasn't for Carlos, I wouldn't even know what a check looked like these days. I need Mel. It is in my best interest to get her back. Period. That's what I feel like he was saying to her. So his mama said that, you know, she don't wish Mel no harm. And that she ain't got no beef with her. Just don't go mistreating him because he the daddy. And my response to that is that I don't give a fuck about him being those kids' daddy. Just because he the daddy don't mean that those kids got to sit around. Not the kids. The kids' mama got to sit around and put up with his shit. And last time I checked, you know, it was him out there using and mistreating people. So he tells her that, you know, he don't think that things going to heal themselves without communication. He wanted his mama to talk to Mel or whatever, okay? His mama said that Mel don't have to apologize to her. And I'm pretty sure that she wasn't going to do that in the first place. So he was like, you know, if she came back around, you'd welcome her with open arms. And that's the thing. You know what I'm saying? I, I saw what he was doing. Mel ain't coming back around. It's like, give it the fuck up. Especially since, you know, he made absolutely no effort or progress towards being a better person. She said that Mel was going to always be the mother of her grandkids. So in other words... She ain't got no problem with Mel as long as she don't be, you know, mistreating her trifling ass son. The one that in her eyes can do no wrong. In Martell's head, in my opinion, he was visualizing this grand reunion between him and Mel and the family getting back together, including their parents. And it didn't work out. Mel invited all of them on that trip, got his hopes up, and it didn't go as he wished it would. So now he's in tantrum mode, okay? But anyway, they made it to the kids' school, picked the kids up, and, you know, they went on their way. So now, you know, it was time for the couples to continue with their um, therapy session at the retreat. And Dr. Francis said that he pretty much wasn't going to come down on Tisha and Marceau's tardiness for now since they had um, experienced a loss. But as far as Tiffany goes, he said that, you know, she made the choice to get up and leave out. So he had planned on addressing that. So Dr. Francis told them that, you know, they needed to figure out if they wanted to play a game or were they willing to be vulnerable and committed. And Marceau was all about games, so I kind of felt like he was more on the side of playing a game, but he claimed that he was going to be open to the process since Tisha wanted him to take it seriously. And plus, you know, he figured that it was a healthy distraction from the loss that they had just uh, suffered. So Dr. Francis told them that, you know, they were only as strong as their 
they were only as strong as their last successful challenge or whatever. Then he turned to Lewis to let him know that when Tiffany went to do business, she left him to do the counseling by himself. And he said nothing, but instead provided a reason as to why it was okay for her to do that. And Lewis defended himself by saying that Tiffany was his wife and that he was going to protect her. Now, Dr. Francis wasn't accepting that and asked Lewis to get rid of the fear that he had of saying something that Tiffany wasn't going to like. Okay, Tiffany told him that she was just waiting for, you know, the other couple to get there. And Dr. Francis let her know that she wasn't there for the other couples. She was there for her. And I, I get Tiffany, you know, that she felt like she could slide out to do her call since everybody wasn't there. But things didn't come to a halt just because Tisha and Marceau wasn't there. She still could have gotten something out of the time that they spent waiting for Tisha and Marceau. I feel like Tiffany wants things to go her way all the time, and she's used to Lewis letting her have her way, okay? There is some kind of underlying fear in Lewis, in my opinion. Maybe he's just going along to get along because he don't want to go through another divorce. I don't know. So Tiffany was just acting like, you know, a brat who was trying to explain why it was okay for her to do what she did, okay? She was telling Dr. Francis that work was a priority for her. And that she had a call that she couldn't move off of her schedule. And Dr. Francis was like, you gonna schedule your way out of your marriage. You know, he said work is a priority for you, but you don't sleep with work. You don't eat work. You don't dress work and so on. So in other words, your priority needs to be your marriage if you want to continue being married. You know, I don't think that Tiffany respects Lewis. OK, sometimes I feel like she don't even want to be with him. And it's just with him for what he can do for her, which is give her financial stability and a baby. OK, and he probably feel like that, too, which is why he ain't gave her a baby yet. But anyway, a woman will never respect a man that they can walk all over, just like a man would never respect a woman that allows him to walk all over her. You know, I'm not saying that he needs to turn into the Scott brothers who want everything to be their way and have no interest in meeting their wives halfway. I'm just saying that he needs to speak up about certain things and not continue to be passive aggressive. OK, and, you know, that's just my opinion. So Dr. Francis continued to come down on Tiffany, telling her that she has allowed work to become so important to her that she has allowed her husband to take second place to it. And Tiffany thinks it's cool and said that, you know, her and Lewis were in unison when the reality of the matter is that they really ain't in unison. Because if they were, Lewis wouldn't be complaining or have his ass, you know, in that rage room beating on microwaves and fucking TVs because his wife is not making any time for him. So after Tiffany told Dr. Francis about her and Lewis being in unison about what was going on in their marriage, Dr. Francis was like, well, y'all are pretty content with not changing. You know, Tiffany had a word for everything. So she then came back at him saying, or you're telling me that we can't have a successful marriage unless we follow your God. And I was like, bitch, you ain't going to be successful if you follow your God. You know, so at that point, Kimmy was like enough of this crazy shit. <laughs> It was, she was like, it was to my understanding that there was a disagreement regarding the time that was being spent at work and together. She was talking about between, um, you know, the Whitlows and, you know, while they were sitting up there trying to act like everything was all good in the Whitlow neighborhood. Okay. Kimmy got to moving those hands. Like she was doing sign language and shit. You know, that seems like the only language Tiffany might understand because she damn sure don't understand English. So Tiffany responded to what Kimmy said by saying that, you know, she was 100 percent at work and 100 percent in a marriage. And Kimmy was like, no, nah, bitch, because that ain't possible. You know, Tiffany was like, well, that's the only thing that works. And I was like, no, it's not working. Your husband ain't happy and you know he ain't and you can care less. And they was trying to explain to her that she can't be 100 percent in her marriage and 100 percent at work. Something is lacking, you know. Your husband ain't happy and you know he ain't. You know what I'm saying? And maybe she ain't happy either. But that's why they should participate in the sessions, in my opinion, so they can get something out of it that, you know, will help both of them to be happy in their marriage. And if they want to continue to be married, you know, I don't know. If they want to continue to be married, I just feel like they should at least try while they're there. Okay, that's just my opinion. So Tiffany said that, you know, she was aware that she needed to make her husband a priority and it was something that she was working on. She knew that she had to make time to fuck him and she knew that she had to, you know, work just as hard to stay married as she did to get them married. OK, I mean, she did surprise them with a surprise wedding. Shit, the least she can do is be good to him. And he went ahead and married her ass instead of telling her, bitch, please, and embarrassing her like Marceau did Tisha when she surprised him with that damn uh, vow renewal. OK. 
So, you know, like if she wasn't going to have time for him, like why marry him? Everybody was probably feeling like, man, it's going to be a long fucking weekend fucking around with the Whitlows. So, um, Kimmy was in the confessionals, okay? And she was like, their resistance, uh, the Whitlow's resistance is mind blowing because these are the same people who had opinions about everybody else's marriage, but couldn't handle people saying anything about their marriage. So Dr. Francis' wife had looked over at the Whitlow's and she was like, so y'all like to play games, right? (laughs) So she was like, bet, okay, let's play. So she had some ropes in her hand and Dr. Francis told them that, you know, each couple was to tie themselves at the ankle, attach themselves to their partner at the ankle, and they were going to walk for 15 minutes tied together. So they all went outside, and they attempted to walk together tied at the ankles. Now, Tisha and Marceau, they did better than the other couples, and they believed that you know it was because they had been married for 16 years and know what works for them pretty much, I guess. you know It was the experience and communication. Uh, Marceau believed helped them. He said that when he felt the rope tight around his ankle, he knew that it was tight around Tisha's as well. Okay. And when it came to Kimmy and Maurice, they were struggling. Okay. With their walk, Kimmy felt like Maurice was holding her too tight and she wanted him to relax a little bit and chill out. So he let her go completely to prove that her way wasn't going to work. And that's what I don't like about him. Instead of just loosening up his grip like his wife requested, he let her go completely to prove a point, which was that his way was the better way. He wants all the control in the marriage. And it appears, you know, he appears to hate it whenever Kimmy has a say about anything. I couldn't deal with him. You know what I'm saying? I, I just couldn't. He her husband, not her father. He wants to lead, but I don't think Kimmy uh, trusts him enough to let him lead. And she shouldn't, in my opinion. Then Tiffany was over there. She decided that she wanted Lewis to pick her up. And him being Lewis, he attempted to pick her up because, you know, there was no way he was going to actually accomplish it fully while being tied together at the ankle. So Dr. Francis and his wife, you know, they was on the porch <clears throat> observing them. And he felt like Tisha Marceau had developed a neck of knowing how to go through the exercise. He felt like Kimmy and Marceau was struggling because they weren't as close as they needed to be. And when it came to the Whitlows, you know, um, Tiffany said that she wanted out of the rope. That's what she told them because she felt stuck and she didn't like feeling trapped. And Dr. Francis noticed that every time Tiffany asked Lewis to pick her up, he did like the little bit that he could do. You know, he wasn't sure that he did it because he wanted to or because he didn't want to hear Tiffany's mouth or whatever. So once they made it back to the porch after their 15-minute struggle walk, Dr. Francis explained to them the purpose of the exercise, okay? He told them that the legs that were tied together represented the part of them that were in you know, inseparable, okay? And the outside legs represented the independent parts of them. So marriage wasn't always about you get yours and I get mine. So with that comes tension when it comes to who decides how to do what and when, which is not always fun. Like he said, he told them that, you know, they were there to give them things to help change their marriage. And the couples, you know, they seemed to have understood what he was saying, where he was coming from, even the Whitlows who were beforehand acting clueless. So, y'all, moving on to the next scene. Mel had went to go see Stormy, and together they were going to center their chakras. I think that's what they called them. So, Stormy had, she had sound bowls and shit, and I guess that that was her peace room. So, she started explaining the stuff to Mel, but it was like, why she was doing that, she was a bit confused herself. But the whole point was of the room was to bring some kind of peace, I guess. But they also had a scene to film, so they had to talk about something related to the show. So Mel got to talking about the event that she did, you know, at the amphitheater. And Stormy had asked her about it, okay, who all came, and she told her that her mom came, the kids, and, of course, Martel. You know, he likes popping up to places he's not invited, like her single release party, where he had the nerve to say that he was entitled to, like, 50% of the earnings from her Telltale Sign song. Okay, since it was about him, old bum ass. But let me get off him before I get mad. So she was telling Stormy, you know, how she wasn't expecting Martel to show up. But when he got there, you know, he acted pretty cool and also acted like, you know, he wanted to talk about something. And he did, but he saved it until they went on that vacation and got his little feelings hurt. So, you know, y'all remember that scene in the What's Love Have to Do? What is that? What's Love Got to Do With It when Tina had overdosed in her dressing room? Because um, Ike had drove her fucking nuts. 
Then when she was in the ambulance, he got, you know, he going to whisper in her ear. And he said, what did he say? He said, if you die on me, I'll kill you or some shit like that. And I was like, how the fuck you going to kill her if she, you know what I'm saying? If she died, you fucking fruitcake. My tail give me those fucking vibes. Crazy ass nut. But anyway, y'all, so Stormy was asking her if she felt like, you know, that was a step in the right direction. Uh, him bringing the kids or whatever. And Mel said that she hoped that it was for the kids' sake. So Stormy asked her how Van felt about Martell showing up. And Mel told her that, you know, as long as Martell ain't trying to inflict harm upon her daughter, she's fine. Then she asked about the dynamic of her and Martell's mom. And Mel said that there was no dynamic because she hadn't spoken to Miss Marlene in damn near two years. And part of that was because she made some comments about her that wasn't true. And I remember that because I had got pissed off when Miss Marlene said that shit. That was when Miss Marlene was sitting there talking to Martell. Uh, I think he had went to see her one day and they was talking and, you know, um, she was telling him how when the kids were smaller, she felt like Mel was going to, you know, kill Martel by having him do so much. Um, she tried to make it seem like Mel was just sitting around the house and just ordering Martel around whole time. Her son wasn't doing enough. In my opinion, once Mel left his ass, it was clear what Martel was doing in that marriage. In my opinion, you know what I'm saying? He was the housewife and the one spending the money that Mel went out there and made, in my opinion. Because, of course, you know, I was just on the outside looking in. That's just my opinion. But, the, you know, that's but that's the way I saw it. And if he was working, I doubt if he was working as hard as Mel was. You know, it looked like he was working harder at being a hoe than he was being a husband and a businessman. So, Mel told... Um, what did she say? Mel told uh, Stormy that in order to protect her peace, she had to cut certain people out of her life or whatever, including his mom, because she's connected to him. So, you know, she said that she still loved Miss Marlene and don't wish nothing bad on her, but she had to remove people that was connected to Martel, even his mother. And I get it because I personally couldn't be connected to anything connected to Martel at all, because at the end of the day, that's his mother and she won't always be on his side, Okay. Whether he wrong or right, no matter what. So Mel said that, you know, they'll at some point get back cool again or whatever, but she's not trying to have the same relationship with her as she did when she was married to Martel because a divorce has taken place, you know, and she's his mother, not hers. And that was pretty much um, with that scene. So the retreat is in progress, y'all. And as far as the couples are feeling, um, about the retreat, as far as how they feel about the retreat, I mean, Marceau said that he didn't really like surprises, but he was going along with it. Tisha was like, well, I told you we were going on a couple's retreat. And he was like, yeah, but this is a couple's counseling retreat. This is couple's counseling. You didn't tell me that. You didn't tell me that, bitch. And, <laughs> and she didn't because she knew that his ass was more than likely not going to come. And it's a shame that she couldn't just talk to him and get him to do something that she felt would better than marriage. He seemed to be against that kind of stuff because, like I said before, he's happy with how things are, in my opinion, because he feel like he's in control, okay, and he ain't interested in changing things about himself that he needs to change, in my opinion. And Kimmy felt like, you know, she and Maurice didn't communicate very well during the exercise, and because um, Maurice is who he is, he wanted her to know that they didn't do well because, you know, they tried it her way, and her way didn't work. As well as his did. That's what he wanted her to know. This nigga going to tell her that, you know, once she wanted to take the lead, it was out of sorts. I can't stand his fat head ass, okay? So, the counseling session was over for the day. And Dr. Francis and his wife had dinner set out for the couple. So, they were all sitting around the table eating. And he asked them if they would share what they got out of the session, okay? So Marceau said that there was a lot to be had from that activity that they did as far as conversation. He felt like a lot could have been gained from that, even if it hurt to be in lockstep, you know, um, you was getting something out of it. So then Dr. Francis asked him how much could they afford to share without feeling depleted. So Tisha asked him if he felt like, you know, there were different they, um, different stages as far as, you know, the sharing goes, because as a mother, she gives so much of her time to her kids. But as the kids get older, they don't need you as much. And then you're able to give your spouse more time. OK, um, I feel like that was a very valid question because there was truth to that. In my opinion, your kids are going to always need you. But, you know, when they're younger, 
when they're younger, they require a lot of your time as opposed to when they get older and become a little more independent and don't need you as much. Then you have more time to get your spouse. And then, you know, the thing with that is that it's important for you to marry somebody who understands that because these guys will be quick to knock you up. But then when the baby comes, it's like they compete with the baby. They're jealous of the baby and mad because a bulk of your time has to go towards the babies. Okay. That they help make because the younger the kids are, the more they depend on you. I think it's crazy when male spouses create a situation because their child needs more than they they need need you more than they do. You understand what I'm saying? And I'm not saying totally ignore your spouse because y'all got younger kids. Of course, you have to find a balance. But, you know, if the shoe's on the other foot, there's no way that, you know, these guys can do what women do. Women be working, looking after the kids and maintain the household, yet their childish ass husbands expects, you know, to have all of their time. You know, and I just wanted to speak on that because it irritates the shit out of me when men do that, especially when they try to use that as an excuse to go out and dip into another bitch. Oh, you you putting too much time in the kids and then they go out there and cheat. Just stupid. But anyway, y'all, to answer Tisha's question. Dr. Francis told her that, you know, as a parent, um, you teach your kid to um, how to become independent. But then once they do become independent, you know, um, once they how do how did he put that? Once they do become independent, you get the empty nest syndrome, even when the kids are at home. And I felt like, you know, that was true. And I think I'm going through that now. You want your kids to become more independent. And when they do, you start missing the days when they needed you. (laughs) So, y'all, that was what Tiffany was going through, okay? Lewis had explained to Dr. Francis how their boys were about um, to be 15 and 16 years old. And they're at the age where they want to do their own thing. But Tiffany want to be all up in their grill, okay? Okay. So she started talking about how she wanted to have another baby, but she said that she didn't want it to be something that only she wanted. And Dr. Francis' wife was like, you know, well, is Lewis not on board with that? And Tiffany told her that Lewis was wishy-washy and she couldn't get a straight answer out of him. I already knew what the answer was, okay? He don't want no damn baby because for one, that would mean him having lesser time with Tiffany, okay? You know what I'm saying? She not even thinking straight. If she ain't making time for him now, how does she think that that's going to get him to be on board to have a baby with her? You know what I'm saying? If she put in work before him, she damn sure going to put the baby before him. You know what I'm saying? Then he going to be in third place instead of second. So it's a no for him, even if he don't come right out and say it. So, you know, Tiffany said that, you know, when they first got married, they agreed that they were going to have a kid. The way that she was explaining it, it sounded as if they had planned to adopt. But when she started talking about having one together, uh, Lewis didn't take it serious anymore. So Dr. Francis was explaining to her that her need for a baby may have something to do with her capacity to attach or to um, distance herself for people so that she won't feel the pain of loss again. So Tiffany went into telling Dr. Francis how the parents that adopted her were addicted to drugs. And I didn't know that. So, you know, he started to explain to Tiffany that she had a major loss at birth. Okay. She didn't have a real parents. Then the parents that adopted her weren't available. That was a loss. And then she married and got a divorce and that was a loss. Okay. And those losses that she experienced, uh, makes it hard for her in her current marriage. So Lewis pretty much said that, you know, that's life. He was married and divorced too, and he lost people. Okay. Um, And Dr. Francis was telling Lewis that he felt like because it's life, Lewis tried to, he, he tried to talk himself through his feelings. And in doing that, he's able to distance himself from those things and never get around to really working through them. And Lewis, you know, started sweating. So he must have felt like it was some truth to that. And Tisha was looking like, okay, so is we going to talk about the Whitlow's issues all weekend? (laughs) This is supposed to be my trip. I need help too, damn it. You see who I'm married to. (laughs) He was looking like I finally got his ass in a counseling session. But all we talking about is them damn Whitlow's. I tricked the nigga this time. He ain't going to fall for the shit again. I got to get it while the getting is good. (laughs) That's the way Tisha was looking. (laughs) I don't know about y'all, but that's what I got from the look on Tisha's face. But anyway, y'all, 
<laughs> Dr. Francis was uh, explaining to Tiffany, um, what did he say? Yeah, what what he was um, explaining to Tiffany, um, it made sense to her because she became emotional. And Dr. Francis told her that, you know, after having those losses, she may feel like having a child will give her reassurance that she won't have to go through life alone because she'll have a baby that will never leave her. You know, I love the way Dr. Francis breaks shit down. He be having your ass sitting there like, wow, you really do. So Tiffany was in a confessional saying how um, she had never heard anyone uh, call what she's been through losses before. She said that she does have a fear of being alone and she might have a fear of abandonment. So she said that she was going to take some time to try to figure out how that impacts her marriage. So Marceau then chimed in and he asked Tiffany pretty much how would she do with her business with a newborn baby? You know, um, I felt like how was she doing her marriage should have been a question, but not from him. No, he got his own issues. But anyway, Tiffany said that she's always been able to function in chaos. So my soul was like, so you're going to bring a baby into chaos. So Tiffany was like, well, it's always going to be something. So why would I plan out having a baby? I didn't plan it out with my first one. And I was like, Tiffany, go somewhere and fix your life. Then worry about having a baby. So my soul then asked Lewis if he thought that you know, he would get more or less of what he wanted, which was sex if a baby was brought into the equation. And Lewis was like, with a job and a newborn baby, I'm pretty sure less, but life happens. And I was like, he know damn well he ain't with that shit. Cause if he was, he would have been gay Tiffany, that damn baby. So Dr. Francis, he knew Lewis was full of shit in that moment. Okay. Cause he asked him how many, phil uh, philosophy books had he, um, read. And Lewis was like, a lot. And Dr. Francis said, I can tell. So Lewis was like, well, you become a teacher somehow. And my soul was like, oh, so you a teacher now? And Lewis said, in my marriage, I am. And Tiffany had this look on her, uh, uh, on his, on her face, like, boy, bye. You teaching who? So it's clear that Tiffany didn't agree with what Lewis was saying, okay? And, you know, even if he was the teacher, whatever lesson he was teaching Tiffany, it wasn't getting through to her. You know what I'm saying? She might have ate a little glue growing up, too. I know Martell had to. But anyway, Tiffany said that, you know, she didn't really know what Lewis was teaching her. However, he does always have something to say. So she was like, there is that part. And I was like, bitch, you could have pretended that he was teaching you a little something. The way he tried to protect your ass. Why you got to make him seem like he delusional? The way your ass delusional thinking he about to give your ass a baby. But anyway, y'all, Dr. Francis was, you know, he was hip to what Lewis was doing. And he said that Lewis gives uh, philosophical, what did he say? Philosophical existential questions where he don't have to personalize things about himself because doing that would uh, involve him being vulnerable and having to deal with his pain. And Lewis kind of disagreed with that. And Dr. Francis said, of course, he would be. <laughs> he said, of course, you would disagree. So y'all, Kimmy was <laughs> Kimmy was still struggling when it came to Tiffany and Lewis. So she chimed in on the conversation again, and she was telling Lewis that Dr. Francis had been married for about forty six years, which is a long time, okay. And he's an expertise in his field, and was trying to tell Lewis, you know, what he thought he sees by experience. But him and Tiffany weren't receptive of that. That's what Kimmy was telling Lewis. Um, she was like, y'all can give advice, but you're not willing to receive it in any way. So of course, Lewis disagreed with that. Okay. And he said that he felt like him and Tiffany had been very open. So Dr. Francis let Lewis know that, you know, everything wasn't great over in that neighborhood. Like Lewis was making it out to be. He said he figured that shit out early on because, you know, it wasn't hard to see. So then he asked Lewis to respond to that, respond to his assessment of their marriage. So Tiffany first wanted to know, before Lewis responded, Tiffany wanted to know what he, uh, Dr. Francis meant by, you know, when he said that their marriage uh, wasn't what they were making it out to be. Because she was like, well, we're not faking anything. So, y'all, this is the part that tickled me when Dr. Francis responded to Tiffany. So, he was like, you remember that word I put up on the board as in the word game? He said, the first level of a game is that you play the game. When your game is discovered, you play a game of not playing the game. <laughs> So what I got from that was that, you know, he felt like Tiffany and Lewis wanted to come to the retreat playing a game of, oh, my marriage is great. Now that Dr. Francis <laughs> know that it ain't great, they plan another game to make people think that they're not playing a game. In other words, the jig is up. Okay. So Lewis was like, 
that's what that's what Dr. Francis was trying to say. The jig is up. So Lewis was like, so you're saying our marriage is an act? Well, Lewis, if the shoe fit, where? <laughs> where? <laughs> but we'll have to wait till next week to see what um to see how Dr. Francis responds to that because that was the episode, y'all. That was the episode. So hey, that was my review. All right, of Love and Marriage Huntsville. Y'all take care, and I'll chat with y'all in the next one.